Hey everybody, uh, I'm back with another game from the Chess Goals repertoire, this time as white, looking at a Grandmaster game in a, a line that I got against the Dutch. And uh, <clears throat> the Chess Goals course does a uh, the Fianchetto system against the Dutch, which is not something uh, I've ever played before, so I, I got a game and then I decided to go uh, look and see what I could find, and I found a, a nice game with some cool uh, ideas that we should be aware of in this. Um, so uh, this is not a position that actually arose from the game we got here through transposition, but uh, this is the chess goals move order. Uh, the game itself went c6. Looks like maybe he was going to talk about doing the the stone wall instead. After knight h3, played d6, and after castles, bishop e7, b3, we have transposed into the uh, move order from chess goals with this move c6 added in, which is actually what happened in my game. So castles, and then bishop to b2, of course. Queen to c7, which makes sense. Black is trying to play for e5. And knight to d2, which uh, is an interesting move. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to note is that why not knight c3, which uh, sometimes the computer was giving knight c3, sometimes it's giving knight d2. And I found uh, a lot of the games uh, are leaving this knight on d2, and I think it has something to do with trying to control the e5 square uh, with an extra piece. So I looked at, for example, if we play knight to c3, which is possible, and after e5, uh, we can play e4, which is again the idea behind uh, knight to d2 and knight to c3 is to support this e4 move. And then after say knight to a6, we, this is where you can see the difference. So with the knight on d2 in this position, we have rook to e1, and this is virtually forcing white's hand to go ahead and take here. Otherwise, we may take, and we've got a lot of firepower here against the e5 square, and it could cost him some material. So, for example, a line might be captures, and then knight takes. If knight takes back, uh, we can play bishop takes, and we're not actually dropping this knight on h3 for kind of a cool resource. Um, so, for example, if he were to try to take it immediately, we have queen to h5, with uh, some big problems here coming almost immediately. Uh, instead, so knight to e4, f takes, we get bishop takes, it plays bishop to f6, trying to like hang on to it. Uh, we can capture, capture, and again, the same problem, you can't capture here because of that tactical resource. Knight to g5 is quite another nice move. Again, pointing that we can't take the bishop here uh, because we will grab on f7. This is going to be a quick mate, king to h8. Bishop comes back to g6, and the queen is going to come with almost instant mate. Uh, which is a nice sideline and just a sort of a discussion of the knight coming to c3 or to d2. Um, so instead, going back to the game, uh, we did get e5 played in the game. And e4 followed up, and f takes. And here, uh, white chose to go sort of a different route than than you would have expected. Uh, typically, I didn't see very many games where white takes on e5, which is what was played here. More, more common was to play knight takes. And uh, with with knight after knight takes, uh, you can't really necessarily capture back. I mean, you can, and we, we're not losing a pawn. We have the same sort of threat as before. If you grab here, we have this check, and we're gonna pick the bishop back up and probably even mating soon or we have some mate possibilities. So instead, I uh, looked at something like bishop to f5, and we just capture here, and I saw a cool idea that I wanted to share with you guys. After bishop takes, we play f4. And of course, if white takes, we're happy, we're gonna bring our knight in, it's a beautiful looking knight. Uh, instead, if he captures this way, we do not capture back, allowing this trade of bishops. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shove these bishops out of the way, and then we can bring in our own pieces and capture here. And now there's all kinds of problems. Of course, um, this bishop uh, f5 was sort of an only move situation. So for example, make a random move like knight to f6 trying to come here. Well, big problems. We have a bishop sacrifice, and you really can't even hardly take it. You take it, the queen comes in with check, uh, you try to drop back, and we play here, and you're going to get you're going to get made it almost immediately. This queen coming out to h5 uh, is a common a common theme we're going to see. There ends up with lots of problems on the light squares. Uh, it happens a lot in this position. So bishop f5 trying to prevent that, uh, which allows us to take 
And then we get this nice shoving back of the pawns with some good attacking tempo. Bishop to e4 comes. Bishop to f5 to try to block it. The queen comes in. There's instant problems. Of course, we can try to trade queens, which is fine. Uh, we can just capture. And he takes back. And this position is quite nice for us. The bishop is forced back to d8. We have control over the open e file. Uh, we can bring our king up, bring our knight across. The d6 pawn is uh, is has some problems. This rook is probably not sitting here. We have a nice king side majority. Maybe we're going to force a pass pawn over there. Uh, it's awkward for black to try to develop either of these pieces. So we should be quite happy to end up in a position like this. Instead, uh, white did choose to take on e5 first. And after d takes, he played knight to g5 instead of the immediate capture. And his idea was that he wants to take back with the knight. Uh, black played a nice move here and plays e3, and forcing white to capture back. And, and now this does open the g file for both players, uh, but it means that this pawn on e5 is not going to be an isolated pawn. White does drop, <clears throat> excuse me, after h6, drops the knight into e4, and black tries to develop. And I like, uh, so queen to c2, and then following up with c5, which is nice, because we're going to try to put a piece into the d6 square. And even though there's not a pawn on d6 anymore, that square is still very weak. And if so we may see something like this happening, where we have two knights against d6. So white plays knight to d5, taking advantage of the square that he got in return. And then knight to c4 makes sense, not just coming into d6, but making sure that uh, we don't drop an exchange plus a pawn right here. And then, so say knight to b4, trying to kick our queen about, and we play queen to e2. And the queen is nice centralized, going to come over. Notice all these light squares are pretty bad. There's no light squared bishop getting over here anytime soon. Takes knight c5, and then we capture back, trading back. Now, we don't have this outpost anymore, but with this pawn gone from e5, all of a sudden there's a, just a lot more squares we have access to on the king side. Uh, the queen needs to move, of course, drops out of the way. We bring a rook in, and we quickly are bringing pieces over to the attacking side. We have much better development. The knight comes back, but it's penned, can't move. Queen to h5, and we would really like to move this knight out of the way, bring a bishop in, and with some definite mating ideas. So knight to d7 sort of leaving the e4 square plugged. Bishop b2, dropping back. We don't want to drop that. Uh, rook takes, just trying to trade off, but this doesn't hurt us any. We're happy to have the only the only rook on the f file. And rook 7 to f6. Um, here, there actually is um, a better way of playing this bishop takes. I looked at this with the computer lines, and it's there's some really cool lines. They're not very human looking, and it's totally understandable why you wouldn't play bishop takes, because you don't want to give up the bishop here. This bishop looks so strong here. Uh, and instead, he played knight takes, hoping that he can bring a bishop in, which is, of course, why black took back with the with the knight, and maybe explains why he traded rooks to unpin the knight on d5. Um, if bishop takes, this allows bishop to e4, this bishop is penned. You can't capture here. You'll get mated immediately. And we're probably going to be playing queen to e6 very soon with huge problems. So this will force the knight to f6. And queen to e5 coming in, centrally locating. And not allowing this bishop to come out. Um, perhaps going to um, <clears throat> continue on with attacking ideas. Just bringing more pieces in. a4 comes. And knight to b6, interesting idea. And also pointing out why this queen is here on e5. Making sure this knight can't move is taking away this square from the rook. Lots of problems. You can't capture here. I will gladly get rid of the bishop, and then this bishop is unstoppable. So bishop to d6, and we drop back, maintaining everything we had. In, but now we've put in a pin here. We're still hitting the rook. We can capture here. Um, it is nice. You can actually just take here immediately, which is going to lead to a similar position in the game. He posed rook to d1, which really solidifies this pin, and now we're threatening just to capture here and win. You can reverse the move order, making sure that uh, you get rid of the light squared bishop, and there's some nice attacking ideas here, but since we're the only ones with the light square. So the rook would capture. We come across the d1, and if black doesn't want to go down a piece, forced to play here, and some, some real issues. We can play queen to c4, making sure that this bishop really cannot move. 
And again, we just play queen to e6 with a big threat. We're threatening to play takes on h6. And this is difficult to stop. We have rook to c7. We can, of course, take on h6 immediately, but putting bishop to, uh, bishop to h3 is even nicer. Because after, say, a3, we can capture king g8, and now we have queen coming into e, bishop coming into e6, and after the rook moves, we have another check coming in, and soon he's going to lose all of his pieces. He's forced to give up the queen here, uh, as taking this way is going to lead to an instantaneous mate just here, and you're you're not surviving. You're you're going to have mate, and it's mate in two here. Uh, so this was a nice idea of taking on c8. But the way that he played it with rook d1, also fine. The bishop did move out of the way. Uh, we just dropped up the nut, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just brought the rook up a square, sidestepping. And after a takes, we get takes back. And he still, there's nothing to be done about this bishop. Plays here, and he's going to try to get some pawns for it. And he does, gets with check, takes here. We, brought, we block with the rook, and he brings in his own rook, because it was hanging. And we play bishop to e4, defending that or sorry, bishop to d4, defending the knight. He gets two pawns for the piece, uh, but here it's uh, there's sort of a three-phase approach here that uh, that black, or excuse me, the white enacts. He's up a piece for two pawns, and he has great activity. But So the first thing he's going to do is solidify his king and to make sure that he never has any problems, no checks on the back rank, and then he's going to start forcing trades. And then that extra piece is going to be able to handle these pawns pretty comfortably. We can watch this happen. So h3, our idea is we're going to put the king on h2 and say we're safe. Behind this wall, this little shield, this is a really nice shield. Sometimes you even have a pawn on g2 and you get the same sort of cave for your king. It's very safe. Bishop to e6, king h2, and then developing and rook to b2. Now we're going to start trying to force some trades. So we've removed the defender of this bishop, comes across, attacks our own bishop, and great. First set of trades done, knight to c4, <clears throat> b5, and knight to e5. Now we force the trade of rooks. So he takes, we take, comes with check, thankfully, king h8, and then knight to c6. We won a pawn in the process. So now we just need to trade the knights, uh, king to f7, and queen to f8. And he comes back, tries to offer a trade of queens. It would be great if we could get that. Black is going to try not to allow that. This is a nice move, a nice idea. Um, we could take this pawn, and that's perfectly fine, and maybe even one of the best moves. But after h4, g4, this is actually pretty obnoxious because uh, we've broken our little castle, and Black's going to get some checks, and this is annoying. So it's totally understandable why White didn't go for that. Instead, gives this check. King to h8, and then knight to e5. Again, we're maybe going to bring our queen into g6. We have knight f7. There's Black is not totally safe, even though there's few or far fewer pieces on the board, which is an idea that uh, white's going to use to try to force some queen trades here. So queen to c5, queen to f5 with a nice threat. We're threatening here or here, picking up the queen. The king comes in, sidesteps that, but we come in, give this check. And the king moves back, and this is nice. We use a fork. We fork a knight. How often do you get to fork a knight? And uh, we're forcing this trade. And after it takes, takes, the queen comes across. And the sort of the last final move is we play queen to d5. And we're going to grab this pawn at the very least. Maybe we might even grab this one to check and then grab the other pawn. Uh, but this basically forces the trade of queens, or much more material is going to drop. The queen comes up. Or sorry, the bishop retakes, and in h4, he plays g4, and this seals it. I mean, it was totally possible to take here. We're uh, almost certainly going to eventually be able to undouble our pawns, but we have this is not what you wanted to go for because it's the wrong color bishop and some real problems potentially here. So after g4, no problems. We can even just set our bishop here. We can walk our king out slowly. We can burn all of the tempi we need with our bishop, and this is going to be like a, a a pawn ending. We could treat this like a pawn ending where we just have infinite tempi, which is almost a certain move, uh, as almost a guaranteed win. Uh, so the 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 plan here that I wanted to highlight is this knight d two, and following up with e four. This is a common plan that we see across this position often in the Dutch where 
where, where black is playing for e5, e4, and takes. And I really like this idea when we take with the knight. And uh, we're happy to have the knight take, bring in our own bishop, and with the bishop on e4, some of these ideas with the queen coming out to h5, some really nice attacking ideas with both of our bishops uh, pointed at the king, along with the knight possibly coming into g5. Uh, I think that this is a really solid plan and something that I hope you guys find useful in your games. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.